<laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> what we do now is take a quarter of an hour break, and then if you feel strong enough to take me for another hour until five o'clock. Yeah. 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 Six o'clock. Oh, it's so good to see you. <laughs> nice to see you. Uh, did I talk to you? No, of course you didn't. You were marvelous. Oh, I'm by all that, because this is what I was steering it around to anyway when I was talking about this discovery that we appear to have powers that we do not recognize. In the 1890s, an American newspaper editor called Thompson J. Hudson became very interested in the kind of thing that Howard has been speaking about. He became convinced that he could influence people directly by his mind. He believed that we possess two minds, one of which copes with the external world, and which he therefore called the objective mind, and looks outwards. The other one, he said, looks inwards and copes with your inner conditions, and this he called the subjective mind. Now, he became convinced that the powers of the subjective mind are tremendous. He'd noticed um, in people he knew uh, there was a strange artist who obviously was able to put himself into certain states where he could paint extraordinary pictures almost automatically, becoming totally unaware of the external world. And he came to the conclusion that men of genius, and he included Shakespeare and Jesus, have a very unusual relation between the subjective and the objective mind, that the two mesh together in a way that doesn't interfere with one another. Now, you can see that in a way we're talking about the right and the left brain once again. But once Hudson had come to the conclusion that we possess this subjective mind, he started to do experiments with it. The first thing he did was to decide to try to influence an uncle who lived in the Midwest, uh, more than a thousand miles away. The uncle was suffering quite badly from arthritis, so that he was confined to a wheelchair. He announced to a, a few people that he intended to start this healing process. And then, before he fell asleep at night, he would summon to his mind the uncle and try to put forth sort of healing vibrations. The reasoning being that just before you fall asleep at night, your mind is wide open, and if you possess these powers, this is the time they'll be able to get through without the interference of your personality. He also found the same thing applied in the mornings, that when you just wake up, this is the time to use this peculiar power of the mind. Now, according to Hudson, Within a very short period, something like two months, he happened to meet somebody who'd met his uncle and who said, you know, it's quite incredible, your uncle's bounding around like a spring lamb. He appears to have no more problems. And Hudson was fascinated by this because he'd taken the trouble to get witnesses to when he started the treatment. And he said, well, when did all this start? And he discovered eventually that it started two or three days after he'd started his treatment. He claims in a book he wrote subsequently called The Law of Psychic Phenomena, which is one of the most important books ever written. Aldous Huxley put me onto it years ago. He claims in this book that he's done this dozens of times since then, and that on the whole it is best to do it without the person knowing. Now, In the 1920s, a Hungarian called Volgiesi wrote a famous book on hypnosis in animals. That is to say, um, the powers of hypnosis um, that are possessed by animals, supposedly, for example, snakes over rabbits. And he proceeded to do a series of experiments. He noticed, um, for example, that it's very easy to hypnotize an animal. For example, um, in India, if they have a particularly savage elephant that they want to turn into a work elephant, what they do is to chain it to a tree 
and of course the thing rears and snorts and tries to tear down the tree, a lot of natives stand just outside the range of the elephant and slowly wave palm leaves back and forward. When they've been doing this for a couple of hours, the thing finally calms down and then calms down to the point where they can unchain it and somebody can climb onto its head, as odd as all this sounds. Now you know that in the 18th century, a monk called the Abbe Faria investigated these things. He noticed how easy it is to hypnotize chickens. If you've ever been to a French market, you'll know that you can buy live chickens. And all they do with the chickens is to take their heads and stuff them under their wings and hand you the chicken upside down. And the chicken does not move. You carry it home. Once you take its head from under its wing, it proceeds to flap around the kitchen. The Abbe Faria noticed this, and he tried this interesting experiment where you take a chicken, you shove its nose down onto the ground, and then you draw a chalk line in front of its nose. And Faria discovered that when you let the chicken go, it continues to stare intently at the chalk line and does not move. He also discovered that you can hypnotize almost any animal and by stroking its stomach. A particular kind of stroking works for dogs. He gives all these details on this famous book on hypnosis in men and animals. Um, toads are particularly easy to hypnotize by stroking their stomach, if anyone wants to try that. <laughs> <laughs> but one of the most interesting things that Volgiesi observed, and that he hardly dared to mention, was that he'd seen again and again in battles um, between different creatures, um, like um, a snake and um, I forget what this small creature was, but it was something that was you know, potentially dangerous and could easily be hypnotized. He has photographs of what is literally a battle of will as they stare at one another. He became convinced this wasn't a matter of uh, suggestion, that they were actually using this direct force one upon the other. Now, when Howard had told me about the unit of pure thought earlier, I didn't realize this is what he meant. In the 19th century, there was a very interesting rape case involving a man called Castellan, Thomas Castellan. Uh, what had happened was that he was a, a beggar who claimed to be deaf and dumb. He'd stayed in the house of a peasant one night, and the next morning early, um, the peasant and his sons had gone off to the fields. Um, Castellan had apparently been seen by a neighbor standing behind the peasant's daughter doing something like that with his fingers, and the girl instantly went into a kind of hypnotic trance. She then left the place with him, and days later they caught up with him, and the girl appeared to be completely in his power. Now he'd done this standing behind her. Um, in another famous case of the 20th century, I give all the details in uh, Beyond the Occult, for example, where I, I cite the cases. A hypnotist traveling on a train began to talk to a woman sitting opposite him. Um, they got off the train at a station for tea, and as they were walking along, he took her hand. And from the moment he took her hand without looking at her, um, she was completely within his power. She went into a kind of hypnotic trance. He then uh, did all kinds of things. He actually turned her into a prostitute and took the money that she made. But it wasn't until he persuaded her to try and kill her husband, and she made one or two rather incompetent attempts which were found out, the police hypnotist or a doctor connected to the police, was so fascinated by this, convinced that she'd been hypnotized, that he placed her under hypnosis and managed to untangle all of the blockages that the hypnotist had placed there to prevent her from telling anybody. And the man whose name was Franz Walter got 10 years in jail for this. Now, all of these things convinced me a long time ago that mind can directly influence mind that there is this one-to-one -one relationship and that hypnosis is not, as Howard says, the power of suggestion, although this is very powerful, that it can be done just as Thompson J. Hudson thought, even from an enormous distance. You see, the fascinating thing about hypnosis is that so far, no one understands what it is. Pick up any book on hypnosis and there is no fundamental explanation of why it happens. 
Now, to me, the answer is obvious. It happens because of Stan and Ollie. What happens under hypnosis is that as the hypnotist talks softly, Ollie, that is your left brain you, goes into a trance. Stan remains wide awake and the hypnotist goes straight through to Stan. And the hypnotist says to Stan, OK, you're going to lie between those two chairs with your head on one and your heels on the other. Three strong men are going to jump up and down in your stomach and you will not bend in the middle. And Stan says, yes, sir, and does it. No problem whatsoever. Sorry? Um, no, this is suggestion, yes. Yes, this is undoubtedly suggestion. But the interesting thing is, why can you not do it when Ollie is awake? In other words, why can Ollie not say to Stan, OK, lie between two chairs and so on? The point Howard is making, I think, is that you can. In fact, someone made the same point to me as we were going out of the door at lunchtime, that in fact, in a sense, when you are hypnotized, you hypnotize yourself. What is happening is that Ollie is not strong enough, so to speak, to say to Stan, lie between those two chairs and become as rigid as a board. Or rather, he can say it, but Stan doesn't believe him. They know one another too well. This is why, as Howard says, it's much easier to get somebody else to do it. Now, in fact, there is no theoretical reason if Ollie had sufficient will force, sufficient authority, why Ollie should not say to Stan, come on, lie between those two chairs and you become as stiff as a board. And for Stan to do it. Because this is precisely what we're talking about. Um, I'm not sure. There's, there are some very odd things going on in firewalking that I must admit I don't understand at all and that may be more complicated than that. Um, I, I can go into that happily some other time because what I'm saying at the moment is that this peculiar power obviously depends upon building up the strength of the ordinary left brain. You know, the ordinary cerebral hemispheres, the ordinary you, the ordinary personality. And that this is all that's at issue. Look, think of this. On a chilly, foggy November morning in 1891, Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson are sitting on either side of the fire in Baker Street. And Watson has read the Times from beginning to end and he's very bored and yawning, hardly able to sort of control his boredom, but merely saying it for something to say. He says, I see Lord Mancroft is dead, Holmes. Did you ever happen to meet him? And Holmes says, as a matter of fact, Watson, that was the beginning of one of the most bizarre cases in my whole career. Would you like to hear about it? And instantly, Watson is wide awake. <laughs> now, you would say that Holmes had done it. But if you think about it, the moment Holmes said, as a matter of fact, Watson, Watson, in a sense, pushes a button in his chest and wakes up fully. He summons the energy of attention. What he's really done, in a sense, is what Graham Greene did by pointing a gun at his head and pulling the trigger. So what Howard is saying, it seems to me, is very interesting and very important. It's a matter of becoming aware, so to speak, that you possess the power. And this in itself is a kind of leap across a spark gap. It happens in one single go. You know, as I was explaining earlier, when I was in Northampton, and I was very, very tired, and I suddenly told myself, you know, you've been optimistic and happy all day long, you are not going to be sick. And instantly like that it went. This lady was asking how you could put Howard's ideas into practice. In a sense, that's precisely what I'd done then. What you were doing is recognizing a force in yourself which exists. And the main problem is that we do not recognize that it exists. And this in itself is a real basic problem. I've been able to do that, but only sometimes. And so, you know, sometimes things have to be just right before 
<laughs> yep. um, isn't that what we were saying earlier about John Cooper Poes and in the Verity case and so on? That you do it somehow and you don't know quite how you've done it. But you do it instantly and spontaneously. And once you've done it, at least you now have an idea of how to repeat it. You still couldn't describe it, and yet you know how to repeat it. This is why Maslow's patients, uh, Maslow's students, kept having peak experiences once they started having them. They suddenly just knew how to do it. But what they'd really seen, in a way, was what Howard has been telling you. They'd seen that Dr. Watson does it himself, not Sherlock Holmes. You do it yourself. And as soon as you can recognize this fact that it is you who've done it, you're suddenly there in one single go. We, we all notice this. For example, getting terribly tired. And then somebody says something interesting. I've often noticed on my walks on the cliff in the afternoon that I'm feeling quite tired and I'm plodding along with a friend who lives locally. And then suddenly he says something quite interesting and suddenly I find I'm back at my Land Rover and I've walked the last mile without, not only without noticing my fatigue, but that I no longer feel the fatigue. Obviously in some funny way I've just done it in one single leap. In London, about six or seven years ago, I know an awful film director producer called Dino De Laurentiis who, <laughs> <laughs> who periodically rings me up and says, Colleen, I need you. And I say, yes, Dino, what do you need? He says, come to London. And I go to London, and Dino presents me with some bum script that makes you shudder. I said, you got any ideas? And I read through the script, and I say, but Dino, who is the murderer? And Dino says, ha-ha, you tell me. <laughs> and then he stuffs me in a hotel room and pays me $10,000 for three days' work. I'm allowed to do what I like while I'm in the hotel room. I can order anything. I can have sort of champagne and caviar for breakfast, lunch, and dinner every day. The last time I did this for him, his hotel bill for three days was 1,100 pounds, which, you know, is $2,200. Uh, $2, and at the end of this time, you know, with luck, I've seen what is wrong with the script and put it right. Now, on the last occasion he did this, the script was so god-awful that I could see absolutely nothing to do to improve it. But anyway, after the first evening, I began to get a few ideas trickling through, and I started working on this thing. And by the end of the third day, I realized, you know, this was so awful and I was getting on so slowly, there wasn't a chance of getting it done in the six days that Dino had given me. Anyway, that night as I lay in bed, I thought, oh my God, and began to get that feeling of panic you get when you feel that, you know, you're being asked to make bricks without straw. And then suddenly, you know, I thought of this thing that I've been saying. I've got a right brain. I've got a Stan whose business is to help me out with these things. And it will never fail to catch you if you fall backwards. And I found myself saying, oh, come on, old right brain, do something for me. And as soon as I'd actually said that consciously, I experienced a great feeling of relaxation and went into a lovely deep sleep, no more anxiety. I woke up in the morning feeling fine, got down to my typewriter at about 7 o'clock in the morning, and typed all day. Now, two days later, I was still nowhere near the end of the script. But on the last morning, I woke up once again feeling fine, began to type early, and then really began to get ideas. And I finished... The last page of that script, as Dino's secretary banged on the door, and came, they were translating it into Italian, and came to, came to collect it from me. And I said, look, I've finished. Can I go home? And Dino said, OK. And with great relief, I clambered on the night train back to Cornwall. I thought, my God, you know, it really works. All the anxiety and misery would not have worked. The moment I actually used my knowledge that I had there, a subjective mind, a right brain, whatever you want to call it, that was actually there, everything suddenly went fine. Now, not only will it do this, I mean, that after all is just power over yourself, it appears to have the most peculiar power to make things happen, to cause synchronicities, preposterous synchronicities. Whenever I start to talk about synchronicities, synchronicities begin to happen. 
a friend of mine, a writer on UFOs called Jacques Vallée, has a story in one of his books about synchronicity. Um, his belief was that synchronicities are rather like sticking a notice on some universal notice board and that, you know, with a little luck, along comes an angel and hands you the answer. And in this case, Jacques became fascinated by a cult in Los Angeles called the Cult of Melchizedek, and a, which, which I've certainly never heard of, but, I mean, know nothing about. Anyway, he tried to find all he could about the biblical prophet Melchizedek on whom this cult is based, and there's apparently nothing, absolutely nothing. But on his way to Los Angeles airport, um, he was driven by a lady taxi driver whom he asked for a receipt for his taxman. She handed him a receipt signed M. Melchizedek. <laughs> so Jacques thought, oh, that's odd. Los Angeles must be full of Melchizedeks. So he looked it up in the L.A. phone directory, which is known as this big, just one Melchizedek, his taxi driver. <laughs> and he said, it's as if you put this notice on the universal notice board, wanted Melchizedeks. And along comes the angel, here, how about that? No, no, that's a taxi driver. I want to know about the biblical prophet. Well, this struck me as one of the most preposterous stories about synchronicity I'd ever heard. Jacques actually prints the, the receipt from the taxi driver in his book about this. And um, I was writing a volume called An Encyclopedia of Unsolved Mysteries with my son. And the question was whether I should write next an article, I think, on Joan of Arc or an article on synchronicity. Now, the other article, in fact, that I was thinking of writing was an article about Edgar Allan Poe's Mystery of Mary Roger and the original Mary Rogers, the New York cigar girl who was murdered in about 1848. At this point, I opened the Mystery of Mary Roger and read its opening sentence, which is, there are some coincidences which are so preposterous that they make the hair stand on end and make you realize they cannot be coincidences. And I thought, this is a clear indication that I should be writing the article on synchronicity. So I pushed the article on Poe aside for the moment and got on with my article on synchronicity. At which point my wife said, by the way, I put an article about Hemingway for you in your box at the top of the stairs. Well, it was an article from a newspaper vaguely about Hemingway, but it was mainly about the fact that the writer had had a series of preposterous synchronicities one of them involving Hemingway. This I used to begin my article. Now, halfway through that article, I told the most preposterous story about synchronicity I know, which is that story of Jacques Vallée's. I finished writing the piece about it, and it was three o'clock in the afternoon time for my walk. And so I got up from my desk, um, left my basement writing room, and as I went out of the writing room, there was a book lying on a camp bed there. There are thousands of books that are lying on the camp bed. I tend to toss them on there. What I hadn't noticed before, I picked up, it was a book called You Are Sentenced to Life by a Los Angeles doctor. And I'd obviously bought it in Los Angeles because I, I'd sent it to the binder and had it bound. Anyway, never having looked at it, it's probably f fallen off the shelf above because I keep all my paranormal books in my basement. I took it upstairs tossed it on my bed, thinking when I get back from my walk, um, I will have a look at that. When I got back from my walk, I sort of went and lay down on the bed and opened the book, and the first thing I see is a full-page advertisement headed, Cult of Melchizedek, and a letter from the lady who runs the Cult of Melchizedek to the author of the book. Now, I've got 30,000 books in my house. One of them has that letter, Cult of Melchizedek. And so I went down to my typewriter the next morning and started, look, you're not going to believe this, but <laughs> it seems absolutely preposterous. There is some way in which these things are deliberately, as it were, designed to jar us into a recognition that there's far more to it than we recognized. You see, I've come to the conclusion that this is the explanation of that old alchemical formula, as above, so below from the Emerald Tablets of Hermes Trismegistos. The usual interpretation is that um, as in the microcosm that is in human beings, so it is in the macrocosm, the, the heavens. And um, they use all kinds of so-called correspondences, you know, between colors and the stars and human states and this kind of thing. My interpretation of it is slightly different. 
I think that what happens is that in some strange way human beings are what you might call transformers. You know, if um, I want to use some American item like an electric razor in England, your American electricity is 120 volts and in England it's 240. What I have to do is buy this little transformer from my local shop, um, run the wires from the plug in the wall to my razor, it will promptly step down my 240 volts to 120 and make the razor usable. In the same way, if I've, I'm here in America and I want to use my English razor, it's equally easy to do. Now, what happens inside a transformer, as you know, is amazingly simple. All that happens is that you've got two coils of wire wound around an ordinary piece of iron. When you run electricity through it, the piece of iron, as you know, turns into a magnet or works. Now, depending on whether you want to transform up from 120 to 240 or down from 240 to 120, you connect up either to the outer coil or the inner coil. Now, it seems to me that many human beings suffer from what, as I said, Anthony Burgess called free-floating guilt from a sort of internal feeling of, you know, it's just not going to work for me. A kind of feeling of feebleness. That these people quite automatically, without realizing what they're doing, connect up the transformer so it steps down from their normal 240 to 120. And then don't understand why things go wrong. Not recognizing that in some strange way they're actually doing it themselves by the way they've connected things up. That conversely, when I did this trip to Northampton, in some way, just as I, would, I was getting into that pessimistic mood of, oh my God, I feel so sick, and automatically tra connecting up my transformer the wrong way around, I suddenly remembered that earlier in the day I'd been in a mood of great happiness and optimism and simply reconnected the transformer the right way. The moment I did that, quite suddenly the sickness disappeared. And obviously, the power was there to do it. So this is what absolutely fascinates me. You see, once you've discovered it, you keep on doing it for the fun, fun of it. It's lo like having a toy. Suddenly realizing that a mere act of thought, a mere act of optimistic thought, can change everything. And then you suddenly recognize the basic enormous problem for the modern world. For nearly two centuries, all thought has been flowing into an increasingly pessimistic cul-de-sac. You know, Sartre's man is a useless passion, and so on. Or the latest, most fashionable French philosopher, Jacques Derrida, who again um, feels that, in fact, we don't really possess any power of thought. Um, is it, sorry? Deconstructionism. Yep, that's right, deconstruction. The Derrida, in a sense, is absurd. I don't know whether any of you know anything about him. But at the moment, if you go to any literary department in any American university, you will find that the most fashionable thing you could talk about would be deconstruction. Jacques Derrida, who makes a vast amount of money from this. Uh, <laughs> what is deconstruction? Well, in literary departments, it means basically a kind of analysis of works of literature in such a way that you unmask the basic contradictions of the writer. And so what you see at the end of the whole thing is that while he thought he was writing it, he was really writing itself. I know that sounds absurd, but that's really what it is. All texts blend into one another. Now, actually, Derrida does this on what he calls a philosophical basis. And as a matter of fact, I want to talk briefly about that tomorrow morning. I'm going to make you work rather hard in the morning. Um, when I was uh, at Esselen, I was very worried about trying to make them think because I know they don't like it. And <laughs> one Sunday morning, though, I got rather carried away and began trying to give them a brief history of Western philosophy and to explain these things. To my amazement, they were wildly enthusiastic. And I suddenly realized they didn't mind thinking at all. So what I want to do tomorrow is, in a sense, to try to present these things to you um, 
in a much more precise intellectualized form, at least for part of the time. In other words, you're going to get the philosophy lecture, so to speak. And you'll see that, in fact, what we are dealing with is a whole Western tradition which has turned itself into a totally negative frame of mind. You are stuck in this. Your kids, if they go to college or university, as being spoon-fed with this stuff, which is basically a kind of defeat. What has happened is that an enormous kind of fallen tree of defeat lies right across the intellectual tradition, completely blocking the road in the West. And somebody's got to move it. Before we can actually advance, this tree has got to be bulldozed out of the way. Now, as far as I can see, me and Howard Miller are the only two in the West who know about this. <laughs> <laughs> There's something you see many psychologists particularly have begun to recognize um, just what is meant by all this for example you know Viktor Frankl the Viennese psychologist um, who discovered the law of reverse effort that uh, Frankl heard about a case in which a boy in a school play um, who stuttered badly was asked to play the part of a stutterer. Once he got on stage, you couldn't stutter for the life of him. And Frankel began to use this as a method for curing his patients. He found that some patients, for example, were obsessives about going through a doorway and getting the slightest bit of dirt on themselves and would rush off and wash their hands and then look at the soap to see if that was dirty and so on. And he used this method of simply putting the patients um, who had this state into cleaning the lavatories. And he discovered that within a very short time, <laughs> this completely cured them. Uh, he had a case before the war of a Jewish clerk in a bank, a Jewish bank clerk, in the days when you had to write out um, accounts with your handwriting. And this man, because he was a Jew, was getting more and more worried about anti-Semitism in Vienna, and his handwriting was getting worse and worse. And he finally went to Frankel, absolutely miserable, and said, what do I do about this? So Frankel said, look, go home, take a pen, and write as badly as you possibly can. Say, I'm going to produce the worst handwriting in the whole world. The man spent an hour doing this and then found he couldn't write badly anymore. And so Frankel deliberately used this technique of what he called the law of reverse effort. But the most interesting story about Frankel was the fact that at the beginning of the war he was among the Jews who were arrested and taken to Dachau concentration camp. And he said that on the train to Dachau, somebody fell asleep in the lavatory so that when they were taken out at midnight and made to line up in front of the wire, um, one of them was missing. And they were all made to stand there all night. And he said they finally got the person out of the train and all the rest of it. He said the strange thing was that they were all sort of chortling and quite happy because they could see that Dachau had no chimney. Now, you can see this is absurd in a way. I mean, it's a completely negative thing, no chimney. If concentration camps never had chimneys, then they'd have been miserable. The fact that Dachau had no chimney and Buchenwald had made an enormous difference. You can also see that the point of the story is that suddenly they had a future. They had no future if there was a chimney. Now it was going to be very difficult in Dachau, but they had a future. Frankel also tells the story that in December 1944, one man in the concentration camp came to him and said that he had a marvelous dream. An angel had come to him and said, look, I will give you anything you like or tell you anything you like. And the man said, look, all I want to know is when am I going to get out of this place? And the angel said, oh, that's easy. Um, on the 30th of March, next. He said, and from then on, this man was absolutely magnificent. He was working with, you know, with other people who were seriously sick, was being really tremendously helpful, and obviously had some terrific inner drive. But as March went on, and it became clear that the Allies were not going to reach the camp in time, 
the man suddenly lost heart and died on the 30th of March. Frankel said, the odd thing was he died of typhoid, which everybody had, he said, but up to then he'd been immune from typhoid. So once again, this recognition that in some strange way something inside us can totally control us and our bodies and everything else. And you can see that take the step into synchronicity and you've simply gone one stage further in recognizing that in some strange way our minds possess a power that we don't even begin to understand fully. Now, this recognition that the mind possesses the power to do this is what we're really basically talking about this weekend. You see, if you can just grasp that one extremely simple point, you can see why De Free John should have got desperate because he just couldn't get anything across. You can see why this lady here said that she can't see how you can actually put this kind of thing into practice because the environment has such a powerful effect. And yet, I think you can also see that if you can just grasp that one single point, you've given yourself a solid foundation. And as Archimedes said, you know, give me a solid foundation and I can move the world. You've got the foundation for your lever, so to speak. That's the significance of Howard's recognition of the existence of the unit of pure thought. Once you've got this something inside you and you can recognize that you can do something with it, that it's not an illusion, you see, it is natural for us in our human condition to believe that we are passive because things are always happening to us from babyhood onwards. Things are happening to us. We're always being shunted into positions we don't want to be shunted into and so on. We're always being imposed upon by other people. We're always having authority forced upon us. The result is that we have somehow a very deep unconscious feeling that we are passive creatures. Simone de Beauvoir has a passage in which he says, I stare into a mirror. I tell myself the story of my own life, but it makes no difference. I don't believe it. I feel that I am not. Now, we can all recognize this, but is it, in fact, something fundamentally in the human condition? Sartre was absolutely convinced that it was. In the 1930s, Sartre was persuaded to take mescaline, which he was told would have a tremendous effect on him. He was told that he would sort of gamble in flowery meadows with uris. He said, in fact, it had an appalling effect. He said what happened was that um, he began to imagine he was being followed by a gigantic lobster. <laughs> <laughs> and he said he hated shellfish. <laughs> But he also began to feel that clock faces were turning into faces sort of squinting at him. He felt that the kind of acorn-like objects on the end of Simone de Beauvoir's laces were dung beetles crawling over her feet. This went on for a long time. Even when he got rid of the effects of mescaline after 24 hours or so, he was in this strange, profound state of depression, which he called nausea, which just suddenly meant that somebody pulls out your plug and you, you go, ugh, dead flat within two seconds. Now, everybody knows this, particularly if something nasty happens to you. If somebody insults you or slaps your face or something of the sort, you do go, ugh, instantly. Your energy goes. But normally, we can prevent ourselves from leaking because that's what it's about, leakages. You leak like a faulty tire. And the point about human beings is that like tires... We've got stamped on us somewhere, keep inflated hard. And if you keep a tire inflated hard, it'll last indefinitely. Try to drive a flat tire and you destroy it immediately. Drive on a half flat tire and you wear it out in half the time. So this business of leakage is extremely important to recognize that this is our problem. Now Sartre experienced again and again this sudden... <coughs> It happens if you get yourself into this state. It happened to me 
in uh, 1973, I was being particularly hard worked. I was working for a sort of crime magazine that would appear as an encyclopedia, and it took a long time to get off the ground, and we all sat around in the office discussing it for month after month, and then suddenly they got the backing from their American backer and said, okay, off we go. And what they explained to me was that as the coordinator, I had to do the central article in every issue. So that, for example, if the issue was on, say, kidnapping, we had a famous kidnapping case like the Lindbergh case, a famous um, kidnapping trial, and I had to write a general article on kidnapping where the word came from and all the famous cases. And what they suddenly told me was that they needed seven articles of 3,000 words each per week. Now, yeah. Now imagine... <laughs> that is 21,000 words a week, which is a full-length book, every four or five weeks. Before Sorry? Before word <laughs> yes. <laughs> this was in 1973. Anyway, um, they were paying me well. I had no cause for complaint, and what I did was simply work very, very hard. And then suddenly they said to me, look, we're sorry about this, but we've got to have ten articles a week. <laughs> well, this meant... And what I had to do was to write an article. There were 12 pages each, 3,000 words. I started writing um, in the morning. I do my research the night before, get piles of books, say, on piracy, if the article was on pirates, flip through them, get a general overall picture of piracy and the famous cases, then write the article starting at 7 in the morning and maybe finishing by midday. Um, I would then write the beginning of the next day's article, if I could, the first half, and the next morning finish it, and then do one more full-length article for the rest of the day, and continue to do this all week. Well, anyway, it was very, very tiring. You felt so exhausted at the end of the day, but, you know, nothing you could do would snap you out of this state of exhaustion. And I was going fine, you know, being basically an optimistic person, and then two bloody Canadian journalists came to call on me and talked and talked and talked and talked, and if somebody really bores you sick, you go, ugh. And this happened one night when they'd kept me up until about 3 o'clock in the morning, talking my ear off. I went to bed having drunk too much wine. I woke up in the middle of the night and began thinking, oh, God, what a terrific amount of work I've got to do tomorrow. And then suddenly began to feel that feeling you get in the middle of the night, you know, that, can I cope? I began getting that kind of fizzy feeling in the blood of adrenaline. And suddenly I thought, maybe I should go downstairs now and start work on the article. And I said to myself, don't be stupid. If you do that, you're really going insane. And as this feeling of increasing unease increased in my bloodstream, I did my best to suppress it by sheer willpower. And that proved to be a mistake. Would have been okay if I'd gone all the way. As it was, it's like bending a very, very powerful spring and suddenly worrying that you'll let it go and it'll flip back and hit you. And at this stage, quite suddenly, my hands began to go very hot and so did my face. My heart began to beat at a tremendous pace so fast that I was afraid it would go too fast and stop. So I leapt out of bed and rushed into the lavatory. And I just sat there on the lavatory until the cold had calmed me down, but I was trying to calm myself like a frightened horse. I couldn't understand what was happening. It just never happened in my life before. Anyway, I went back to bed. As soon as I was in bed, it started again. I got out of bed this time, went into the sitting room, put on the light. Luckily, my wife didn't notice anything was wrong. I sat there thinking, what has happened to me? Is this a nervous breakdown? Is this a heart attack or what? Anyway, finally, after a couple of hours, I went back to bed. I didn't relax. What I did was to stare at the window frame with total attention and try to keep my mind blank. And finally, I woke up a couple of hours later having fallen asleep without noticing. But I felt absolutely awful, completely dead, completely flat, and with that awful feeling in your stomach that you've had some very bad news. And from then on, for the next few weeks, it was dreadful. Because when I went to bed in the evening, I was low, completely tired. And if I woke up in the night and began to think about the panic attacks, the panic would come on instantly. 
with this flooding into your bloodstream, so your face goes hot and your hands go hot, and the heart begins to beat faster and faster. Now, I finally discovered the technique for getting rid of this. I realized that it was no good lying there in the dark, you know, just hoping it would go away. What I had to do was to wake myself up as fully as I possibly could. And as soon as I was wide awake, it was like a schoolmistress coming to a room full of quarreling schoolchildren and <laughs> doing that. Instant silence. In other words, without even realizing it, I was using Howard's unit of pure thought. Once I discovered the schoolmistress effect, it was much, much better. One day I went to London to do a television program, and incidentally the man who was interviewing me said, yes, I suffer from this too. And on the night train back to Cornwall, suddenly the panic came on, and because I was in a strange situation on a train, it was very, very difficult. You get the terrifying feeling that your heart will stop if it goes too fast. And of course this scares you, and more adrenaline floods into your bloodstream, your heart goes faster still. And the more you worry about it and try to suppress it, the more difficult it is to suppress it. It's like trying to stop yourself, let's say, from trembling when you're feeling absolutely terrified. Well, on the night train, I thought, well, there's one thing I can do. When it stops at the next stop, I can get off and walk in the dark anywhere. That'll distract me. And the knowledge that I could do this meant the next time the train stopped, I didn't get off. I just lay there. And then, when the train started again, I felt a little better. I began trying to calm myself. And I continued to do this soothing myself until I'd soothed myself back into a state of normality. Then I suddenly had an interesting recognition. If I could soothe myself into a state of normality, I could soothe myself into a state of super-normality. And so having soothed myself this far, I went on telling myself, relax, 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 until finally my heart had almost stopped. I could hardly feel its beat. And I was suddenly in a totally floating condition of absolute total calm. And it was then that I realized, in a sense, I discovered the secret. This was the basic answer. See, it always struck me as so absurd. What was I afraid of? There was nothing physical, no cause. And yet at any moment, this sudden flooding of adrenaline into the bloodstream and the heart pounding. And the recognition that in some way, I was up above it, and provided I recognized that I was up above it, I'd got the answer. This was so important to me that I began my book Mysteries by describing all this in some detail and putting forward a theory that I called the ladder of selves, a theory which I've since abandoned, but which nevertheless, basically I feel, had some truth in it. I was trying to explain the phenomenon of multiple personality and the belief that we possess a whole series of selves that we evolve through. Unfortunately, this ladder of selves is not like a normal ladder which has parallel sides. It's shaped like that. So the higher you try to climb, the more you have to compress yourself into the narrow rung. Unfortunately, it's terribly easy to fall down the ladder and expand, let yourself go. And this is obviously what I'd been doing. I think that was a kind of turning point in my life. It was a recognition that in the last analysis, I had the control. I was in charge. And in a sense, it was the awakening of this thing that Howard has been talking to you about today. An extremely unpleasant way of awakening, I must confess. And yet, in a sense, I still feel that that was one of the luckiest things that has happened in my whole life. I must say, at the time, it seemed by far the worst. It seemed that there was nothing good whatsoever about this state, because it seemed to drag you down from underneath in a way you couldn't get at. And yet, the mere fact that I dug in my heels and said no. Let me just finish by saying one more thing. One of the most interesting recognitions that came in this state and the real turning point was one day 
when I was writing a book about witchcraft, and I was in this state of low pressure, nausea, I was writing the most appalling things about the inquisitors in the Middle Ages and so on, and torturing women and children to death. And I needed a particular point uh, for my narrative, which I didn't have in my room. And with terrific effort, because these things drain your energies, you just don't feel like doing anything. I forced myself to get up and go upstairs to my library shed and search for the book, and I couldn't find it there. And I thought it must be in another place, and went and looked there. And as I looked there, I suddenly felt myself sinking into a kind of void of misery. And I thought, is this it? Is this the point where the mind snaps? And where you suddenly go down, as Margaret Lane did when she read the thing about Hiroshima? And at this point, you know, I thought, well, I don't care. I've got to go on. So I went ahead. I found the book I wanted. I went downstairs now feeling as if I'd got a horrible leaden suit on that was dragging me down. I sat at my typewriter and I knocked off the pen, <clears throat> which was at the side of the typewriter, onto the floor. And as I bent to pick up the pen, something happened. It just went instantly like that. Just disappeared, totally. And I suddenly wanted to burst into laughter as I realized that in some sense, I'd called it bluff. And I knew that from then on, it would never happen again. And it didn't. Can I ask you a question about the relationship of leakage to hitting bottom, which is what you're describing? And in fact, you were leaking a lot. Mm. In fact, you were at your full leak, you know, you yeah, all the way in. and it was somehow hitting the bottom that you could test your metal and have the eye in you that had, that, 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 that you needed the bottom to, to, to really establish that, uh, that sense of strength to survive. So, isn't it true, and, and a lot of psychologists today talk about hitting bottom in order to really get to that place, and so isn't it a little contradictory then? I'm not sure. All, all I can say is that I didn't break at any point, because at any given point, no matter how bad things were, I knew that if I dug in my heels like, like a stubborn donkey, and refused to be dragged forward, nothing could drag me forward. Nothing short of breaking my back with an iron bar, which I thought was what was about to happen on this occasion. And all I did always, no matter how bad it was, no matter how bad the panic was, was refuse to let go. And it was a very uncomfortable sensation. It was like having diarrhea and refusing to let go. But the basic sensation of not letting go was the most important thing, and I think that was my salvation. When, uh, when you mentioned uh, Victor Frankl, I remember uh, years ago when I read his book, and the first paragraph impressed me very much. He said that while he was in the concentration camp uh, and was witness to all the brutality, callousness, and unfeeling, most terrible, inhuman treatment of people, he felt profoundly and deeply the value and power of love. In contrast. See? And uh, I wonder how maybe you might touch on that tomorrow or at any time. That the, in that profound... In that, in Ashley Montague also speaks about the power of love to integrate and to maybe press that button that uh, Howard says of thought, or what you say, <laughs> of uh, raises in higher dimensions. Uh, I, the, the, the humane quality, the, the, what is the, the potential of humans, as actually uh, Monty said, is to be cooperative, to be kind, to be compassionate, to be understanding, to be, co you know, mm. part of that, what Howard says is that intelligence is out there, and we're part of, as individuals. And love can be an avenue, the love that is 
as, as Franco said, in, in, in an environment where it was totally lacking horrid cruelties, he found that that is the value of love and the, and the power of love, the meaning of it, the beauty of it, and the grace of it, and salvation of it. And what we are seeing today is that in, in, in the violence and the wars and everything else due to the de deprivation of love. Well, I don't think we could end on a better note than that. <laughs> Good, I'm glad it's warmer this morning. Returning to what Howard was saying yesterday, I describe in the first chapter of my book, The Occult, a man called David Foster, who wrote to me out of the blue. He's a cybernetician and had also been a member of uh, an Uspensky group, a disciple of Gurdjieff. And uh, he told me that as a cybernetician, he'd got extremely interested in this problem of life as um, a programmed entity. He said, for example, that if you look at an acorn, it is actually just a program for an oak tree. And you stick it in the ground and the program works itself out. As you know, cybernetics is basically the science of control, of making a process control itself. <coughs> you know, like a word processor and this kind of thing. Simplest example being the, the cock and ball in a, a lavatory um, basin, you know, that cuts off the water when the water reaches a certain height. Now, what fascinated David, who isn't in any way a sort of religious character, was that it seemed to him that the energies required to program life on Earth were far too high much higher than we've actually got on Earth. One of the basic sayings of cybernetics is that red light can be programmed by blue light because blue light has a higher wavelength. But blue light cannot be programmed by red light, which is lower. You can say in the same way, you couldn't drive your car unless your mind moved faster than the car. Um, if, in fact, the car engine moved faster than your mind, you'd, you'd crash. You must be in control of it. You need that higher degree of complexity than the car itself. David Foster said that it seemed to him, when he looked around at nature, it was surely impossible that this kind of molecular complexity could have been programmed by any of the energies present on the surface of the earth. Um, he compared an acorn to one of those plastic biscuits you used to stick into washing machines to make them work, you know, a kind of square thing with the program stamped around the edge. I don't know whether you had them here in America, but you shoved whichever edge into the washing machine you wanted. And he said that an acorn was roughly like this, and that the only energies that were capable of programming something like an acorn would be cosmic rays. So he came very seriously to the conclusion that life on Earth has been programmed by an intelligence outside the Earth. He wasn't in the least interested in God or anything of the sort. He said that it was impossible scientifically to believe that life on Earth had not been programmed by much higher energies which do not exist on Earth. That, I think, you know, sheds an interesting light on what Howard was saying yesterday. Secondly, one thing struck me very strongly while he was talking suddenly hit me very clearly at one of those little jumps in thought that connect together two things you've never seen as connected. In The Outsider, I'd been fascinated by, by what I call life failure. That sudden feeling of, oh God, you know, what a bore everything is. Auden has a poem with the lines, put the car away when life fails, 
what's the good of going to Wales? <laughs> and, <laughs> I keep asking in the outsider, why does life fail? What happens? We know that Sartre's Rockentin in nausea um, had got into this state, as Sartre himself had, from taking mescaline. And this had somehow blown his fuses uh, so that he had a sense of meaninglessness. Now, when, De when Howard was talking yesterday about the way in which our minds can envisage, first of all, a beach and then switch to a snowy mountaintop, it suddenly struck me that this is, in a way, the basic problem of human beings. Our trouble is that, suppose you want to decide whether you are going to travel somewhere by bus or by train or aeroplane or whatever. If you've done it before, what you're trying to do is to envisage the journey and decide, you know, on that basis where, which you want to do. So you're always making choices by that act that he described of conjuring up a scene in your brain. Now, the basic problem with human beings and the re reason for life failure is that we are always jumping too far ahead of ourselves and conjuring up some scene that hasn't yet occurred, so to speak, or conjuring up some scene, you know, that, that couldn't occur, some horrible disaster. But mainly, <clears throat> I'm talking simply about that tendency we have to jump ahead and see what we think will happen in the near future. So that you think, uh, for example, of a process like um, eating. If you've eaten very well, and then, you know, an hour or two between meals, you may still, when it comes to meal time, think, you know, well, I'm still not very hungry. If, in fact, somebody said, I don't think there's going to be any lunch today, <laughs> you suddenly find yourself getting very hungry. <laughs> uh, law of <laughs> reverse effort. And I was always fascinated by an episode in a novel by a novelist called Agnar Mikla from Norway. He had a very sad time, Mikla. Um, his first book came out just a couple of years, I think, before The Outsider a novel called The Hotel Room, which made him quite famous in Norway. But he was very influenced by the American writer Thomas Wolfe. And later books were part of an enormous autobiographical um, work. But unfortunately, he was so frank about sex for the Norwegians of that time that uh, his books were slaughtered by the critics. And as far as I know, he stopped writing. But the first book, The Hotel Room, had an extremely interesting episode in which a man knocks on the door of a girl in the hotel and says, um, look, I want to warn you, there's, you're in danger. There's a man in this hotel after you. And she says, who? And he says, me, and leaps on her and tosses her on the bed. <laughs> <laughs> they, um, they sort of struggle around for a while. Um, she's not sort of entirely worried, but eventually... <laughs> I mean, she'd obviously scream if she were, but eventually she, um, she gets into a position where he says, look, you know, if you're not careful, you're going to end up pregnant, at which she says, oh, okay, well, in that case, um, let me prepare myself. And she gets up and puts in some contraceptive, and he can smell the smell of the contraceptive, and he experiences a sort of deflation. He doesn't actually sort of fail, but the sex is just not the same as it was a few moments before, all of that intense excitement has somehow evaporated. Now that, I've been in court, inclined to call the Agnar Mikla paradox. That problem that he wanted her badly, and that the moment she says, OK, the desire partly disappears. In fact, um, it's possible to completely disappear. There's a story by Maupassant called The Unknown, in which a man sees a girl in the street who attracts him tremendously, um, but he only catches glimpses of her. And then one day, as she passes, um, he follows her and manages to get in front of her and 
stand by a shop window. He gets her in conversation, and to his amazement, when he propositions her, she says, OK. And this already worries him a little. It's too easy. <laughs> they go back to his room, and she gets undressed. And as she stands with her back to him, he sees down the center of her back a fine line of dark hair. And for some odd reason, this completely puts him off. You know, the sort of, perhaps the connotations of the demonic. And he says, when it came to the time to sing my song of love, I had no voice. <laughs> <laughs> and the girl sort of looks at him with disgust and says, Monsieur, if you were incapable, why did you invite me here? And puts on her clothes and goes away. And he tells his friend, you know, well, I've, I, I see her in the street occasionally, but she always walks straight past me. <laughs> now, there you see this... Oh, uh, you may have to go and get cushions or chairs from, there's one chair in the front, yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's better than being frozen stiff over there. <laughs> We can open windows. If you get too warm, let's open windows. So you can see what's happening in cases like that. The mind is jumping ahead and already creating fulfillment, with the result that the fulfillment is not as exciting as it should be. Now, um, think, on the other hand, of someone who at any point is not sure whether the fulfillment will arrive. Um, the English novelist John Cooper Powys, um, whose work also contains some very interesting analyses of sexual paradoxes, has in one of his novels an episode in which a man is um, trying to seduce a pretty girl who isn't really very interested in him. And the man, a schoolteacher named Magnus Muir, pursues her relentlessly for month after month after month. And one particular morning is absolutely ecstatic because the evening before she allowed him to go just slightly further than usual. And the same day she runs off with somebody else. And yet, you can see that because he was always unsure of the fulfillment, he never at any point let go. He never jumped ahead, created the fulfillment mentally, as it were, and then mentally let go. Because you can see that is the solution of the Agnar Mikla paradox. In a sense, as soon as he sees and smells the contraceptive, he already feels that, you know, okay, I'm halfway there, and instantly, let's go. So, the problem you can see is that our minds are always running ahead, and if only we could stop the mind from doing this, if only you could discipline your mind enough, as Howard was suggesting yesterday, to stop it from running ahead in this way. Hold it still. Don't let it jump to premature fulfillment. This is obviously the basic answer. But of course the problem is that most of us, in order to do that, need to deliberately create a difficult situation. A situation that would prevent us from jumping ahead because we're too nervous or worried to do so. What you have to do, as you can see, according to Howard, is in fact to train yourself to keep the mind so still that it no longer keeps running ahead to premature fulfillment. Because this, you see, for me, is the absurd paradox of humanity. This fact that 
life failure, put the car away when life fails, what's the good of going to Wales, is due to the fact that you were already, so to speak, anticipating Wales. There's a passage in Huisman's novel Arebor, translated as Against the Grain, which, as you know, was one of the great... Uh, there's just one more seat down the front here, if you like. I'll just pull out the seat. Okay. It was one of the great decadent novels of the 1890s and influenced Oscar Wilde tremendously. It's a novel about a man called Des Essaintes who has uh, a fortune so that he can afford to do exactly what he likes. And he has the house completely covered in black velvet, which he draws during the day because he hates the daylight and wanders around Paris at night. He has what he calls um, his taste organ, um, a rack of liqueurs set up rather like an organ so that you can press different keys and have a tiny drop of a liqueur fall into a glass and sort of <laughs> mixing the liqueurs and tasting one, one by one and so on. Anyway, hey? there's a point in the novel at which Des Essaintes, reading about London of the 1890s, suddenly experiences a tremendous desire to go to London. And so he rushes to the Gare du Nord and, first of all, goes into the English restaurant there where... He eats a large English beefsteak and drinks a pint of porter, revels in this English atmosphere. Then he thinks, ah, but if I now go to London, when I get out of the cab, you know, it'll be wet and cold. In fact, everything that will happen will diminish this intensity that I now feel drinking porter and e eating English steak. And so he packs up and goes back home again. <laughs> uh, maybe you should grab some cushions from across there and bring them down here. There's just one more, one more seat at the front here. Uh, yep, there's one, one more here. And there's a cushion here too. Yep, why don't we do that, yeah. Des Essaintes has done, sitting there in the Gare du Nord restaurant, he's allowed his mind to run ahead to London, and because he's anticipating London, which won't contain this essence of Englishness that he gets in the restaurant at the Gare du Nord, and because his mind has run ahead, he no longer wants to go to London, because he's already achieved, so to speak, partial fulfillment of the desire, and his mind then rushes ahead and does the rest. Yeats has a, a fragment in one of his poems talking about neither loose imagination nor the old mill of the mind consuming its rag and bone can make the truth known. And if you can't forget a silly tune, how can you possibly discipline your mind? Change your thoughts. What he'd seen in a flash is that, in fact, we do this all the time. But you do it so quickly that you're not aware of doing it. It's just like doing this. I'm not aware of pushing a button to make my hand go up and down. I just do it spontaneously. The result is that I take it completely for granted unless there's something wrong with my arm. And then I realize that it's not spontaneous. What he's saying is that somehow we've got to recognize that spontaneous act of the mind and then proceed to discipline it so that it no longer runs away. It's like taking a very vigorous dog for a walk on a lead who insists on almost dragging you off your feet all the time. Our minds do this continually, running forward. Somehow the dog has got to be tightly disciplined. And that, it seemed to me, and that suddenly struck me as he was talking yesterday, is one of the most important unifying insights I've had for a long time. <laughs> 
You see, man is at the moment a very, very young species. It's almost as if he were created only yesterday. And this is the basis of our problem. You see, our ancestor, Cro-Magnon Man, only came on the scene, we think, about 50 or 60,000 years ago. And we think he did this by exterminating his predecessor, Neanderthal Man, who, as far as we know, um, was sort of much more ape-like than we are. Although, in fact, discoveries in Neanderthal tombs of uh, painted objects, um, discoveries of Neanderthal graves containing perfectly circular stones that are obviously images of the sun, do seem to indicate that there was more to it than that. See, what Howard was saying yesterday about um, animals, whether animals have a unit of pure thought, the same question struck Maslow when he was studying apes in the Bronx Zoo in the 1930s. What Maslow did was to devise an intelligence test for the apes, which consisted of a complicated cage and a banana <coughs> somewhere inside the cage. And then he kept the apes hungry until they were released into the room with the cage and the banana. And they proved to be intelligent enough to work their way into the cage and to get the banana. Then after a while, Maslow tried substituting a wooden banana to see how far this would diminish their motivation. To his surprise, it didn't. When they'd finished with a wooden banana, he would hand them a real banana instead. And they were perfectly happy with this. He finally got to the stage of having the complicated cage with just some object in the middle of it that didn't interest them at all or shouldn't have interested them as food. They were still doing the puzzle with as much enthusiasm as ever. And yet these things are supposed to have no intellect. It's quite obvious that just like us, they are in a sense obsessed by discovery, by evolution. If you've ever seen the face of a baby who for the first time learns to turn a door handle, that sense, you know, of something important happening. In fact, let me read you this passage which always strikes me as one of the most moving things in that line that I know. It's the description by Helen Keller's nurse. The nurse, Mrs. Sullivan, says, you know that Helen Keller was um, blind and deaf and dumb. So it would apparently be totally impossible to teach her anything. In fact, she was able uh, to teach her by writing letters on her palm, on the palm of her hand. In a previous letter, I think I wrote you that mug and milk had given Helen more trouble than all the rest. She confused the noun, the noun with the verb drink. She didn't know the use for the word drink, but went through the pantomime of drinking whenever she spelled mug or milk. This morning, while she was washing, she wanted to know the name for water. When she wants to know the name of anything, she points to it and pats my hand, and I spelled water and thought no more about it until after breakfast. Then it occurred to me that with the help of this new word, I might succeed in straightening out the mug milk difficulty. <coughs> we went out to the pump house, and I made Helen hold her mug under the spout while I pumped. As the cold water gushed forth filling the mug, I spelled water in Helen's free hand. The word, coming so close upon the sensation of cold water rushing over her hand, seemed to startle her. She dropped the mug and stood as one transfixed. A new light came into her face. She spelled water several times. Then she dropped on the ground and asked for its name and pointed to the pump and the trellis and suddenly turning round, she asked me for my name. I spelled teacher. Just then the nurse brought Helen's little sister into the pump house and Helen spelled baby and pointed to the nurse. All the way back to the house, she was highly excited and learned the name of every object she touched so that in a few hours she'd added 30 new words to her vocabulary. P.S. 
Helen got up this morning like a radiant fairy. She's flitted from object to object, asking the name of everything and kissing with a very gladness. So, what's so interesting is that Maslow discovered that apes obviously have precisely this kind of excitement about learning, of doing something purely for the fun of it, virtually doing crossword puzzles. So, it seems pretty obvious that our Cro-Magnon ancestor of 60,000 years ago was basically like this, even before he could communicate with more than grunts. Now, I don't know whether you've come across a book by Julian Jaynes called The Origin of Consciousness in the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind. This strikes me as one of the most interesting and challenging books I've ever read. Although, as you'll see, I disagree in one way with its central thesis. What Jaynes suggests is this. He thinks that in very early civilizations, you know, the ancient Greeks, the ancient Hebrews, and so on, people actually heard voices inside their heads, which they mistook for the gods or for God. He thinks that ancient man was, as he calls it, unicameral. That is to say, his, he just had one room inside his head. Now, that meant that he had no room for any sense of himself. As far as he was concerned, he was like a camera looking around him at the outside world with no feeling of his own existence, or rather, no feeling of his own identity. Now, James thinks that in that state, if you were asked, let's say, to go up river and build a dam, he wouldn't have enough memory to remember, when he was halfway there, what had happened. But what happened was the right brain came to his rescue. The right brain, as it were, like tunes walking into Mozart's head, would suddenly say when he was halfway there, don't forget that dam. And he would assume that this was the voice of the god-king of the tribe. And James goes on to suggest that this kind of thing happened with the ancient Hebrews and so on. In other words, God is your right brain. He had this theory to begin with, because one day, when he was lying asleep, uh, half asleep on a sofa in a certain state of tension about some work he was doing, he suddenly heard a voice coming from his upper left-hand side in the air saying, include the knower in the known. And he leapt off the settee, and looked under the settee, looked behind all the curtains and couldn't find anything. And then thought, my God, I'm going insane. Then, when he went to see his doctor about this, the doctor said, oh, don't worry, that's just an auditory hallucination. Um, lots and lots of people have them. In fact, apparently, 25% of Russians have them, and something like 10% of most other nations, you know, Anglo-Saxon nations. It's interesting, isn't it, Anya? He thought that these familiar auditory hallucinations are in fact a leftover from that time in the remote past when our right brain was the substitute for the, for the God. And then he goes on to talk about the right and the left brain and uh, gives one of the best expositions of this that I know, of the fact that um, if you have a split-brain patient looking at a book open in front of him, one page, um, the page in front of his left eye connected to the right brain would be completely blank, absolutely blank, until he actually turned his other eye onto it. This, by the way, isn't, isn't absolutely true. It's a little more complicated than that. Both eyes actually see are connected to the right and the left brain. So what we're talking about is what are called visual fields, but that makes no, no profound difference. Anyway, James's theory was that because of this state, so to speak, of blessedness, you were continually in the presence of the God. <laughs> uh, there's a cushion down here. That's about all I can suggest. <laughs> because you were continually in the presence of the God, man was, to a large extent, uh, a peaceable sort of being. 
peaceable. Well, yeah, peace, peaceable. Yeah, yeah. Quiet. Yeah. And tranquil sort of yeah. person. Not particularly warlike. And that this began to change slowly as civilization became more complex. Now, we know that what seems to have happened is that something like um, 3000 BC, people began to build these strange monuments like Stonehenge, which appeared to be, and which we now know were indeed, astronomical calculators. This means that to some extent they'd finally begun to notice the movements of the heavens and to see, more or less, what was happening as far as the seasons were concerned. So, for the first time, man began to realize the necessity of having a calculator instead of, as it were, a kind of unified, instinctive sense of nature. I've no doubt whatever that their shamans had this kind of unified sense, their priests, that they were made priests for precisely that reason. All our ancestors, for example, would have been able to detect water by merely walking over it, as we actually can. Um, the first time I tried this, I had a dowser staying with us, and uh, he suggested that I try it down at a group of stones called the Merry Maidens, Again, one of these ancient stone circles dating back about 2000 BC. And I said, no, it's no good. I can't do it. I, c I can never do these things. And he said, show me how you hold the dowsing rod, which, as you know, is just a V-shaped rod made of two bits of plastic tied together at the end with string. So I showed him, ho holding the two ends in either hand. He said, no, no. He said, look, twist the ends like that. So I twisted the ends so the dowsing rod had now turned into a kind of spring. He said, OK, now try it. So I walked between the two standing stones nearest to me. To my surprise, the dowsing rod went, oink. So I thought, oh, I did that myself, you know, by ch changing the pressure. So I went back and it went, oink. <laughs> and when I'd done this a dozen times, I realized that, in fact, something in the stones was causing the dowsing rod to jump up. And what's more, when I held it down below my navel, it went down instead. It was obviously a purely scientific effect. But what was happening? I'm pretty certain that what was happening is that my feet were sensing the earth currents, the currents involved in the setting up of these standing stones, and that my right brain, to which the striped muscles are connected, which controls the striped muscles, was saying, OK, you're over water or you're walking between two standing stones which have been deliberately placed there because the earth current in the ground there is so powerful. My right brain was doing it. And it's this right brain that appears to have all of these peculiar powers that we're speaking about. One of my favorite stories is that story of the tiger hunter Jim Corbett, the man who wrote Man Eaters of Kumaon, whose job was she shooting man-eating tigers in India. One morning when he left his home, he could see his footsteps in the dust where he'd walked home the previous evening. And to his surprise, at one point, the footsteps veered across the road, went on the other side of the road for a short time, and then came back. He couldn't remember why he'd done this. But he did notice that it was a culvert, a, a sort of low bridge, so to speak, in the ground where he'd, he'd done this, gone to the other side. So he went and examined the ground below the culvert and found the paw marks of a tiger, which had obviously been lying there the night before. Now, he had no memory whatsoever of this. All that had happened is his right brain had said, tiger, told his feet to walk across the road and landed him on the other side of the road. And then he said, the tiger probably wouldn't have attacked me. But if I'd alarmed it by suddenly throwing my gun from one shoulder to the other, it might have leapt. My right brain, he didn't say my right brain, he called it jungle sensitivity, just was not willing to take this chance. Now, oddly enough, we all have this power. Years ago, in Los Angeles, I was giving a talk at um, the <coughs> University of Los Angeles, 
And afterwards, I said to my wife that I'd meet her in Disneyland with my children. I'd forgotten how big Disneyland is. <laughs> <laughs> and when I got inside Disneyland and saw these crowds, I thought, oh my God, stupid. I should have you know, said somewhere specific. But anyway, I'd given a good lecture and I was feeling happy and relaxed and confident. And so, I simply said to my feet, okay, take me to them. <laughs> I just left my feet to walk. My feet walked down the road, turned left to some sort of store that was selling Mexican food, and there they were. <laughs> this, you see, is the right brain. As I say, it will never let you down, provided you know that it will do it. Provided you know it's there and call upon it, as I did on that occasion. So, <clears throat> this was something that our ancestors, Cro-Magnon man, naturally possessed. They were at one with nature. They had the feeling of things going on around them. Walt Whitman has descriptions of this in many of his poems, this feeling of odd oneness with nature, the feeling of being connected to the universe, to other people, and so on. But then Whitman also says, you know, why aren't human beings more like cows? Cows never whine about their condition and so on. Which is all very well, but Nietzsche answered this when he said, we want to ask the cows the secret of their happiness, but they can't tell us because they've already forgotten the question before they can give the answer. <laughs> what we want is the ability to rem not only remember questions, but get the answers. Now, according to Julian James, um, this is what happened to human beings at some period uh, round about the year 1500 BC. My own theory is that what happened is that this started in the Mediterranean area when there was a tremendous volcanic explosion on the island of Thera. That island to the north of Crete is actually now a kind of circle with a great hole in the middle, or rather two broken bits of a circle. What happened around about 1500 BC, was that um, Thera, now called Santorini, exploded like a bomb. It was one of the biggest explosions in the history of the human race, certainly. And it destroyed most of Mediterranean civilization. It must have sent a tidal wave 100 feet high, roaring straight across the Mediterranean, destroying the northern Crete, an enormous amount of Greece, an enormous amount of Turkey, enormous amount of Egypt. Suddenly, human beings found themselves in this new terrain, sort of drenched in mud. Suddenly, the people driven out of their lands by the tidal wave were forced to look around for new lands. Suddenly, life was far more difficult, incredibly difficult. You'd have to imagine a modern city ravaged by bombs or artillery to imagine the position that they were in. And as soon as you're in this position, you've got to concentrate whether you like it or not. And as soon as you begin to concentrate in this narrow way, you lose that lovely feeling of contact with nature. James cites some Babylonian document of around 1150 BC, which has the curious phrase in it, um, something like, um, his forehead is wrinkled with headache. He also speaks about a statue um, of the king God and says that earlier one of these kings had been portrayed as sitting on the throne beside the God. I think it was Tiglath Pileser. Later, he said, a mere 50 years later, you suddenly got the statue of the king kneeling in front of the empty throne of the God. The God has disappeared. Why has the God disappeared? Because human beings are now concentrating fiercely. And as they concentrate fiercely, then suddenly they lose that sense of oneness with nature, oneness with the gods. The result is the sudden eruption of cruelty 
into human history. When I said this to um, an English archaeologist called Jaquetta Hawkes, she said, oh, nonsense, um, have a look at these something or other tablets. I've forgotten what they were. She said they date um, 2500 BC, and they show a king um, with slaves in front of him sort of about to strike off their heads. So I went to the trouble of getting the illustration of the tablet. It doesn't actually show that at all. What it shows um, is some early Sumerian king with his hands raised above his head as if he's a boxer uh, shaking hands, and all of these people kneeling in front of him in homage, obviously captive slaves because there are soldiers in the background. It does not show any sign of cruelty. What's more, we know that the ancient Egyptians were extremely kind to their captives after they'd won battles in the third millennium BC. Cruelty begins, as far as we know, round about 1200 BC. And in fact, in the British Museum, uh, there are some tablets dealing from, with this period, the Babylonian period, which are so horrific that they're kept in the basement. Pictures showing you know, women and children being impaled by the invading armies and so on. Now, I think James is almost certainly correct. Cruelty came into human history fairly late, and it came in as a consequence of our ability to concentrate. Concentration ruled out this bigger universe. But I think that the next step in human history is the really fascinating one, because we're getting down towards 600 BC, and quite suddenly you get a strange explosion. To begin with, you get the Greek merchant Thales, who was the first person to really recognize the application of geometry, um, not just to the heavens, but to all kinds of practical things. The first scientist, in, in other words. And then a century later, you get this strange explosion, which included the Buddha, Confucius, Lao Tse, Socrates, um, the Indian sage Vyasa, who was supposed to have written the Bhagavad Gita, and so on. All in one century, you suddenly, quite suddenly, get a number of these sages, as if some evolutionary trigger has done it. And the interesting thing is that these people have learned to think for the fun of it, something no one had ever thought of doing before. Thinking before was something you did to solve problems. You might build the Great Pyramid or Stonehenge as a giant computer to help you solve the problems, but basically it was all about solving problems. And now quite suddenly, in this period of Plato and Socrates and the Buddha, you have a completely new approach. What they are doing is saying, life itself is a problem. It's a question mark. How can I go about solving this problem? Something that no one had ever done before. Why? Because they had gods. Children don't particularly worry about the question of why they're alive because they think their parents know the answer. <laughs> Quite suddenly, you have this explosion of thinking for the pure fun of it. You know, that story in the symposium in which um, Agathon, I think it is, describes how when he was in the army with Socrates, he says Socrates suddenly became absorbed in a problem one evening when he was due to join the others at mess, and people began going around the camp saying, Oi, Socrates is out there, go and have a look. And there was Socrates standing absolutely still with his hand on his chin. 24 hours later, Socrates was still there, and suddenly Socrates said, and turned and walked off. <laughs> He'd obviously <laughs> got the answer. <laughs> I mean, the story is obviously an exaggeration, but it does illustrate what I'm talking about. Now, the other most interesting reply of this time was, of course, the Buddhas. You remember that, according to the legend, the Buddha was a prince who was brought up in a palace and the servants had instructions that on no account was he to learn anything unpleasant about life. And so he knew nothing about illness or death. Then one day, a servant took him for a walk, 
and he saw an old man walking past, and he said, what's the matter with him? And he said, there's nothing the matter with him. It happens to all of us. We just get old. And the next day when they were going out, they saw a sick man being carried along. And he said, what's the matter with him? And he said, nothing the matter. He's just sick. And the next day they went out and saw a dead man. And once again, the answer was the same. It happens to all of us. And the Buddha was absolutely shaken and began trying to think how we could get out of this trap <laughs> that we have appear to have been caught in. And the answer, of course, the Buddha's answer, was cease to desire, because it's desire that causes all our problems. His answer was, in a sense, if you can cease to desire completely, what you can do is to get into right brain states, which he called nirvana. Let me explain to you what I mean by that. Alistair Crowley, the so-called magician, for a while lived on um, Cefalu in the Mediterranean. And one of the people who became his disciples was apparently uh, a Hollywood film star of whom I'd never heard called Elizabeth Fox. Anyway, she wrote to him from Hollywood and Crowley thought, in, thought she was going to be a stunning beauty and hastily invited her to come and stay on Chefalu. Anyway, uh, she arrived and uh, she proved to be a character actress, sort of <laughs> middle-aged lady in her 50s. But she said to Crowley, OK, you know, when do I start learning about sort of magic and so on? And Crowley said, well, the first thing you have to do is prepare yourself. He said... There's, you'll find a pup tent on top of the cliff there. There's a, a trench at the side of it you can use as a latrine. And every day, once a day, a boy will bring you up a pitcher of water and a loaf of bread. Um, sit there until I tell you to come down. And she said, I don't intend to do that. So I said, well, it's up to you. Um, the next boat leaves the island in one month's time anyway. <laughs> and so she decided she may as well do it. And so she said she went and sat there. And she asked Crowley before she went, what am I supposed to do? Crowley said, look, don't worry. He said, you'll find that you've got the sun and the moon and the stars to play with. Well, she sat there grimly for 24 to 48 hours. And gradually, boredom turned into a kind of rage. <laughs> but, you know, she realized she had no alternative. Um, she went on sitting there. Around about the third or fourth day, the rage turned into an absolutely dull feeling of total flatness. And then, quite suddenly, she went into a strange condition of ecstasy, of quiet peace. And she said at the end of the 28 days, she didn't want to go. He was quite right. She had the sun and the moon and the stars to play with. She just sat there. Now, you can see all that had happened is that <clears throat> the person who went there was left brain Elizabeth Fox. And Crowley could see immediately there she was all obsessed with herself and, you know, preoccupied with... Huh? Success. Yeah, success and getting somewhere and so on. That he immediately recognized that this simply had to be got rid of. And what he did was to make her sit still until, as it were, her right brain did exactly what it had done for Freud's birth of Pappenheim. In her case... Um, it, as it were, split her into two people so that she was doing silly things like climbing trees and not knowing she was doing it. But in the case of Elizabeth Fox, a certain point came where the boredom and everything else had exhausted her left brain and she was sitting there completely passively when the right brain said, OK, why didn't you ask me to do this to begin with? And simply took over and suddenly deep, total relaxation. That is at least a version of nirvana. That's what it's all about. And this was the Buddha's answer. Yet, I think you can see that in a certain sense, it's a very negative answer. You know, don't desire anything. Certainly not an answer that we in the West would find very satisfying. Because, you know, we don't necessarily regard desire as a particularly good thing, but we do feel that you're not going to evolve if you simply sit around in a state of nirvana. Or, of course, um, if the one aim in your life is the negative aim, 
of getting rid of all your desires. Socrates, of course, had a sort of more positive vision. In the Symposium, he talks about the way in which when we become deeply absorbed in anything, in other words, when we direct love towards anything, then everything begins to change for us. That you begin by loving individuals, that as your mind broadens, um, you begin to feel love of nature, then eventually love of ideas for their own sake, and eventually, if ever, love of the universe itself. You know what Plato's disciple Plotinus called the flight of the alone to the alone. So all of these came up in the 5th century as the answer to that question mark. Man, in other words, had learned to sail out onto seas that he never sailed on before. He'd always been, so to speak, a land animal. Although H.G. Wells has rather an interesting passage at the beginning of his experiment in autobiography that reverses that image, and which also strikes me as extremely important. Wells says, I'm tired and bored with the things I'm forced to do as a writer, with the people I'm forced to meet, and everyday affairs which are now beginning to overwhelm me to the point where I can't even think straight. Then he goes on to say, the interesting, this by the way is what I talked of yesterday, is the words with method. He put it on paper. I'm fed up. <laughs> and then he goes on to say, since the beginning of time, Human creatures have been up against it. All animals have been up against it. Our lives are a succession of problems. He said, now for the first time, we've got a civilization which takes care of many of our problems. With the strange result that you can say to a man, yes, you love, you hate, you have a family, you do so-and-so for a living, but what really interests you? I mean, something that obviously everybody in this room understands. He went on to say that man of the present moment is rather like animals that first of all drag themselves out of prehistoric seas because the prehistoric seas were extremely dangerous and drag themselves onto land. But these fish animals had no feet. They could only move on land with their flippers. Consequently, were totally exhausted after a very short time on land and had to get back to the sustaining medium of the water. And yet, they hated the water. They'd much prefer to be on land. And eventually, because they would prefer to be on land, they developed legs. This again, you see, is the central point in a way of what Howard was saying yesterday. Want something, direct your mind towards it, and it will happen. You have an invisible octopus, so to speak, in your head that can reach out and do things. Now, that's an interesting image, this notion of man as an early amphibian who's dragging himself around on prehistoric beaches, hating the sea, and yet, so far, not having proper legs. So that after a few hours on the land a few hours, let's say, in the world of the mind, of ideas, he's so exhausted that he has to get back into the sea, into, you know, some sustaining medium of actually doing something. You know that if you put somebody in sensory deprivation in a totally black and silent room, the first thing that happens is that they sleep, sometimes for 48 hours. Then when they wake up, their minds are marvellous. They use this at some universities, and um, students use it before exams, because their minds are suddenly glowing. They can suddenly see from a bird's eye view everything they've learned during the semester. But then if you stay in there much longer, you begin to get this odd desire to get up and do something, switch on the TV, go for a walk. And it's then that the problems arise, because, of course, if you're in the black room, unless you press, press the panic button, you can't. The result is, of course, that um, this has been used um, in the East for brainwashing. If you leave someone in there long enough, 
You brainwash them far more effectively than by torturing them. You can turn people into double agents and all kinds of things because their minds go completely soft in the black room and have become totally malleable. When I was talking to Maslow about this, Maslow said, ah, I've solved it. I said, you've solved it? He said, yes. He said, you just put self-actualizers in the black room. We'll have a stretch break, by the way, in about um, half an hour. <clears throat> you just put self-actualizers in there, and they can stand it for much, much longer. And I said, how long? Maslow said, 15 days. And that is amazing, because most people go to pieces in the black room within three or four days. But I said, and what if you left them in for 16 days? <laughs> and he said, they go to pieces. So, in fact, there's no basic solution to the problem of the black room. Human beings are not yet strong enough to withstand sensory deprivation. Let me, just for a moment, by the way, to digress onto this Maslow business. As you know, Maslow devised what he called the hierarchy of needs or values. He said, if a man is starving, the only thing in the world he thinks about is food. And he believes that if he could only just have one good meal a day, he would be ecstatically happy. <coughs> Nothing else would matter. If he gets to the stage of having one good meal a day or two or three good meals a day, he now becomes preoccupied with the next level of need, which is, you know, for a roof over his head. So every tramp dreams of retiring into a country cottage. He thinks that if only he could have that and a good meal, everything would be fine. There'd be no further needs. And in fact, of course, if you were in the country cottage, you'd once again begin to experience the next level of need, which for Maslow um, is the sexual level, or not just the sexual level, but, you know, the need to be loved, the need to give love, the need to care. And, you know, everybody who completely lacks a person of the opposite sex obviously has this basic sort of feeling of, you know, how wonderful it would be. On the other hand, if you achieve this level too, the next level emerges, which according to Maslow is the self-esteem level. The level at which you want to go out and impress people. The level at which women start giving sort of morning coffee parties and men join rotary clubs. <laughs> the, the point at which you want other people to sort of say, you know, morning Mr. Smith, to recognize you. This basic need for recognition Maslow says that the next level of need is what he calls self-actualization, which does not necessarily mean creation, although artists, by definition, are self-actualizers, so are great scientists, mathematicians, and so on. The self-actualizing level is just doing something well for the sake of doing it. It could be putting ships in bottles. Or he gave an example of a woman he'd come across who was brilliant at bringing up children, and when she brought up her own, just went on adopting children and bringing them up, because she was good at it. This was self-actualization for her. i tell you another extremely interesting point that struck me thinking about this. Crime in the past 150 years has gone through Maslow's five levels of need, or rather four of the five. During the 18th century, all crime was economic. In other words, people were doing very often just for the sake of food. When you move into the Victorian age, you suddenly enter the age of domestic crime. An enormous number of criminals are doing it to protect, you know, their domestic security, the background. Um, the murder of uh, Professor um, Parkman by Webster in the 19th century is an example. You know, the Harvard professor who murdered the fellow professor who threatened to denounce him for not repaying some money. The next level is the sexual level. Sex crime did not begin until about 1870. And the first major sex crime was the Jack the Ripper murders of 1888. You find this difficult to believe, but I'll um, substantiate that a bit later. Then, round about the period at the end of the war, when sex crime had reached a, a kind of um, climax, 
at least in the sense that m most of the, what you might call the great sex criminals, <laughs> were now in the past. People uh, you know, like um, Jack the Ripper, Albert Fish, Sylvester Matushka, a Hungarian who used to wreck trains because he had an orgasm as he saw the train jumping off the rails. Um, <laughs> and suddenly, in the 1960s, you got a new type of crime, the self-esteem crime. Crime committed by people because they wanted to be somebody. A man called Robert Smith, a 19-year-old student, walked into a beauty parlor in Arizona, made all the people in the beauty parlor, seven, lie on the floor, and then shot them all in the back of the head. When asked why he'd done it, he said, I wanted to become known to get myself a name. <laughs> the odd thing being that he was a good student and apparently a good son. He wasn't a nut. And of course, the Manson case over here is again a typical case. Manson was obsessed by this feeling that he was as good as the Beach Boys and the Beatles and so on, and he felt that he just never had a chance. And so you turn it against society. In England, our Moore's murder case was the same kind of thing, Brady and Hindley. You suddenly get the self-esteem level of crime, and this is the level that we're in at the moment, and serial killers are all people with self-esteem problems. Anyway, <clears throat> all of this helps to explain this tremendous change that took place in the 5th century. And then, of course, you had a fairly long period, a kind of dark age, in which civilization, to some extent, went backwards, in which all of the achievements of the Arabs and the Greeks were more than half forgotten, in which the only philosopher who was generally known was Aristotle, and he was regarded as absolutely infallible, um, simply because he was the philosopher of the Christian church. You know, for example, that Aristotle states that a body dropped from the mast of a moving ship will fall behind the mast. In fact, as you know, if you're on a moving train and you drop a penny, it falls at your feet. It doesn't fall over there. So Aristotle, in fact, you know, produced these ideas out of his head. He thought they were logical, and very often they weren't. Now, what happened was that, of course, the Christian church made an enormous difference in taking over people's lives. This was, you know, Dostoevsky's Grand Inquisitor that we were speaking of yesterday. Did an enormous amount of good, too. By emphasizing this gospel of love, but nevertheless, basically, uh, the Christian church was sort of much like communism in Russia, a completely rigid system, and you were expected to fit into that system and not even to leave your home village without, you know, the permission of the Lord of the Manor or whoever. Which is why the change that occurred around about 1300 was so interesting. The poet Petrarch, who was a friend of Dante, was the first person we know in history ever to climb to a hilltop to look at the view. And his poems were incredibly popular. His poems were incredibly popular for the same reason that Dante's Divina Commedia, which was written roughly the same time, about 1310, was incredibly popular because it was a love story. And this brings me to one of the central ideas that I believe to be a motive of human evolution. What was it that caused this brain explosion over half a million years? Why did man become so clever so quickly? One explanation is maybe, you know, Arthur C. Clarke's, or the one implied in David Foster's intelligent universe theory, that is, that forces from outside were feeding us with some kind of information. But I think the almost certain explanation is that our caveman ancestors became hunters. Now this meant that for quite long periods, the young men of the tribe were away from the tribe, and the ones who were the best hunters, the ones who produced the most food, would obviously be the heroes of the tribe. When they were away from the tribe, they'd obviously become rather sex-starved and get romantic feelings about the women of the tribe behind them. As you know, most animals go on heat. 
periodically. Man was the first animal to actually get rid of this estrum mechanism to be able to have sex at any time. And as soon as man be, be, became able to have sex at any time and also became a hunter, suddenly woman became an object of romantic interest. And the man who was the best hunter could have his share of the most attractive women. I believe that that explains why man began to strive. Goethe was quite right. It was the eternal womanly drawing us upwards and on. I think that basically man's sexual romanticism has been the reason for his evolution and for this tremendously swift evolution over such a brief period.